Hi everyone, Matt here from CarWow. So today in this video, what I'm gonna do is reveal to you what I think are the best ever sports cars from Toyota. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to vote on which of the five you think is the best overall. And unfortunately, this new Supra, even though it is the A90 limited edition, isn't in my list, simply because I'm disqualifying it for the fact it's mainly a BMW. Yeah, the outside may look very, very different and be very Japanese, but the rest of the car, the engine, the chassis, everything else is German. Anyway, on with the video. Right, and let's kick off this video with the first car on my list, this beautiful 2000 GT. So there's three key things you need to know about this. This is Japan's first ever supercar. It was actually built for Toyota by Yamaha and was in production between 1967 and 1970. Also, this swoopy design was inspired by the Jaguar E-Type. However, unlike Jags and Porsches of the day, this was kind of double the money. So it was actually Ferrari money. But then that's to be expected because it was rather rare. Only 351 were built. Also, it's very high tech. So the bodywork, that's aluminium. It was the first Toyota to be fitted with all-round disc brakes. It's even got a limited slip differential. And there's something quite funny about it. At the front, it's got dual headlights. The second set are pop-ups. Now, the reason for that is US regulations, which state that you have to have headlamps above the knee, and these lower ones just aren't. The first thing that you notice when you climb inside this 2000 GT is just how cramped it is here on the inside. I mean, look at this. I've got no headroom at all. The car actually appeared in the James Bond film, You Only Live Twice, but Sean Connery was just too lanky to fit in it, so they had to cut the roof off for him. In fact, there were two open top versions of this car made specifically for that film. And because it's so small, Toyota came up with the idea of cutting away the door like that to make it easy to get your legs in. Though I'm not entirely sure what that's gonna do for safety. Speaking of health, you've got an ashtray there with a cigarette lighter and another on the other side, because of course in the 60s, smoking was good for you. But the rest of the car, absolutely lovely. I love the wood finish. It's great. Like the grab rail there for the passenger, the old fashioned stereo, the fact you've got a switch for your turn signals. Then there's some other things that aren't so great. So everyone goes on about the way that older cars have brilliant steering feel. Well, there's no assistance here. There's quite a lot of weight over the front. So yeah, I'm getting a lot of feel in my arms as they're burning from the workout. Then there's the gear selector. So to get into reverse, you have to move it all the way across and then just tug at it really hard to get into reverse. The rest of the gears are actually easier when you're driving. I do like this though, the umbrella handle for the parking brake. That is cool. Another thing I like is the sound of the horn. It's kind of a real classy baritone. Oh, <laughs> it sounds like it's on its way out. Hopefully the engine isn't, let's give it a go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. The 2000 GT uses a two litre straight six from a top level Toyota Crown. However, Yamaha have tuned it. They also fitted it with three twin carburetors. The result is 150 horsepower and 175 newton meters of torque. The engine drives the rear wheels via a five speed manual gearbox or a three speed automatic. Tell you what, this is a little bit of a treat, isn't it? Get to drive such a rare and gorgeous car. I wouldn't describe it as being necessarily quick, but it does sound pretty amazing. <laughs> Handling wise, oh, yeah, old car steering and a slippery steering wheel on this hot and sweaty day. <laughs> Feels nice though, but not as nice as that exhaust sounds. <laughs> oh, that's to die for. <laughs> and if I get too carried away, I might die. So yeah, I'll slow it down. It is quite hard to see what's going on behind you in those wing mirrors, but I suppose you do have the rear view mirror basically in your face. And you really get a sensation of the road beneath you through this low slung seat. What a lovely car. The second car on my list is the Corolla AE86. Now, unlike the normal Corolla, which was front wheel drive, for this sporty version, Toyota decided to make it rear wheel drive. Yes! Now that made it really popular with drifters. 
It also starred in the Initial D manga comic series in Japan. It's a good looking car. You could get it as a coupe, which is this one, or as a hatchback. Personally, I prefer the coupe. It just looks a little bit sharper. I like the two-tone paint scheme on this one and that pea shooter exhaust at the back. It's all very retro. This car is in great condition, and if you want one like this, you're going to be looking at around £15,000. If you think the outside of this car looks cool, then check out this interior. It looks especially awesome in this two-tone brown. It's like sitting inside a humbug. The seats, super comfy, love the material, they grip your body well. I like this as well, the way the headrests operate, and you can instantly recline the seat if you fancy asleep or get it in your perfect driving position. This car was actually built between 1983 and 1987, and the quality in here is actually better than Toyota's cars of the 1990s and early noughties. I mean, look, center console test, it passes. Then there's the gear lever, which does kind of look a little bit like a sex toy. Hmm. Still, the back seats are very roomy. So too is the boot, and you can fold down the back seats if you need to carry longer items. I also like this. The door pockets are like bits of carpet on elastic. I love it. I could run this as a daily driver. It's just so usable. There is one problem I had with it when I first got in it. I was trying to get the key out of the ignition. I was like, why can't I get it out? You have to press this button like that, and then you can release the key. Yeah, I did look like a bit of an idiot for two minutes, which to be fair is shorter than normal. The AE86 is powered by the same 1.6 litre twin cam 16 valve petrol engine that was in the Mark 1 MR2. So initially it had 130 horsepower and 149 newton metres of torque, but then it was detuned slightly later on to 120 horsepower for reasons. At least the engine is pointing the right way, so lengthways, and it's right over the front axle rather than in front of it, which means this car has a perfect 50 50 weight distribution, and that helps make it easier. To drift so too does the fact that you could get it with a limited slip differential first things first let's talk about this engine because it's an absolute screamer rest for days red lines at 7000 rpm plus it sounds really fruity <laughs> and raspy the throttle response is epic flex your right foot instant pickup glorious the steering well it's quite light even though it's not power assisted so that does mean that it's nice and pure which is perfect for <laughs> feeling what's going on the gearbox is quite long in terms of the throw but it's all right also it's very light it only weighs about a ton and that plus the fact you've got this great big glass area means you can drift it quite easily i also like the horn just listen to this I'm an A86. The third car on my list is the Celica GT4 Carlos Science Edition. So it was built between 1991 and 1993 to celebrate the fact that in 1990, Carlos Science won the World Rally Championship. So you can tell it apart from the normal GT4 by the fact it has a redesigned bonnet. So there's some extra ducts there to let heat out of the engine bay. You've got a little inlet there to call the timing belt. And then at the front, the bumper has more vents on it as well. And down the sides, you've got Carlos Science's signature. Only 5,000 of these were made world wide and if you want one of these now in decent condition you're looking at about fifteen thousand pounds there's a definite sporty theme here on the inside i really love these sport seats and they're in good condition considering the car has done 115,000 kilometers it's very much like a normal sleeker really of this period though you do have the plaque there with carlos science edition they're saying this is 1969 out of the 5,000. there's some interesting quirks as well so when you take the key out the ignition the steering wheel pops up automatically to make it easier for you to get out. In terms of other practicality, the back seats aren't too bad and the boot is rather large. What this car is lacking though for modern motoring is air conditioning, especially on a day like today when it's hot. Thankfully, we've got a sunroof, which I think will keep open. My favorite thing though is this, look. Pop-ups, hell yeah. This car has a two litre twin cam 16 valve petrol engine. Obviously it's turbocharged and the Carlos Science has a water to air intercooler rather than the normal air to air intercooler. It has 203 horsepower and 271 newton meters of torque. It's got permanent all wheel drive with a viscous coupling in the middle and at the rear it's got a torsion limited slip differential. So driving the Celica GT4 and the first thing I want to do in homage to Carlos Science is a Scandi flick into the corner and four wheel drift round it but better not do that eh? 
What I'm willing to do though is rev this engine out. Actually goes all right, you know. It's not crazy fast, and you don't really need to rev it that high, and it doesn't sound that great either. But what I do like is the gearbox. This five-speed manual is actually really nice. And the steering, I mean, it's like all old cars. It's kind of slow, but it's got a decent amount of weight to it. Makes me miss hydraulic power steering. Brakes too. They are not bad at all. And of course, this car has ABS, which was quite novel back in the day. The fourth car on my list is the Mark IV Supra Twin Turbo. So this car was built between 1993 and 2002, and it was made famous by the Fast and Furious films. Now this is a European spec car, and you can tell that because the standard it came with a bonnet scoop, and it also has a neat little drop-down spoiler at the front to improve aerodynamics at speed. So these cars are highly desirable now. You get a good automatic version, it's gonna set you back about 40,000 pounds. A good manual, you're looking at 80 grand. The reason these cars go for so much money is because of that. Toyota's legendary 2JZ engine. Now in Japan, it put out 280 horsepower, but for the rest of the world, the car did 330 horsepower, thanks to some slightly different turbos and larger injectors. Peak torque, 440 Newton meters. But that doesn't tell the whole story. The thing about this engine is that it's dead easy to tune. On standard internals, you can take it up to about 500 horsepower. And with some modifications, these things can do a thousand horsepower. In fact, I've driven one with a thousand horsepower and it was just nuts. Oh, Christ. Inside the Supra does feel very sporty, the way you've got this wraparound cockpit, which is very much like that of a fighter jet. But there is a lot of black plastic about the place. It doesn't feel cheap. It's all relatively soft and yielding, which is nice. The seats are good as well. What's not so good, though, are the seats in the back. They're dreadful. The boot isn't great either. It's quite shallow. Hmm. As you can see, this one is the Auto, so it's less desirable. But personally, I prefer the Auto rather than the six-speed manual. So the reason I prefer the automatic gearbox is because it just suits this engine so very, very well. At low revs, you've just got one turbo working, but it picks up nicely. No lag at all, really. And then when you get to 4,000 RPM, the second turbo kicks in and this thing just takes off. Here it goes. There we are, <laughs> we're on boost now. And it flies, not 60, it's like 4.7 seconds, which is really, really quick, even by today's standards. Also, top speed is 155 miles an hour, but that's limited. If you de-restrict them, they'll do 177 miles an hour. It's insane. They're a nice cruiser, actually. I wouldn't say they're out and out sports cars. I mean, they handle well enough. The steering's quite light, but it's direct. And you get a good view out of them as well. Much better than a new Supra. I wouldn't mind just having one of these to just pootle around in. So if I had one, I'd probably want to tune it. And then if I wanted to tune it, I'd regret having the automatic rather than the manual because the manual can take more torque. So it's better for tuners, hence the high price. The fifth and final car on my list is the GT86. Now, some of you might be thinking that I should disqualify this because it's not 100% Toyota, just like the new Supra isn't. However, it was built in conjunction with Subaru, which Toyota owns part of. Also, Toyota had a lot more involvement in this car than they did the new Supra. So it's here and it's a worthwhile contender because it's a great car. So it's a classic front-engined, rear-drive sports car. It's fitted with a limited slip differential for added traction or better slides because you can turn the traction control all the way off. Yeah. Now this car first went on sale in 2012 and you can still buy it now. They're 27,000 pounds. The inside of this car isn't particularly exciting because it's all very dark. However, the design is actually pretty perfect. So the dash is nice and flat, which gives it a sporty feel, and it's quite low, so you get a good view forward. The steering wheel is in the perfect position, as is the seat, and the seats themselves, they really do hold you in place when you're hooning around the corners. They're not so good in the back, though. In fact, they're pretty blooming terrible, but the boots are decent size, and really the idea is that you fold down the rear seats and use all that space for carrying two spare wheels so you can always get home from a day's drifting. Now, I will admit that the engine in this car is pretty much 100% Subaru, even though it also says Toyota on it here. Yeah. You see, it's a Boxer 4, which is classic Subaru. The good thing about it being a Boxer means that the center of gravity is nice and low, which aids the handling. So does the fact that the car is relatively light, 1,250 kilos. Good job it's light as well, because it hasn't got much power. 
200 horsepower and only 205 newton meters of torque. One of the great things about the GT86 is that it's designed to give you thrills at low speed. So the tyres are actually off a Prius, they haven't got much grip, and that means you can get it sliding and moving around beneath you quite easily. And you can really feel what's going on, the steering's super sharp, the gear shift is to die for, it's absolutely glorious. The engine makes a nice noise as well, though you do have to spank it to get anything from it, so it's not doing anything now. Yeah, that's 7,000 RPM. And then it's quick. These cars really do benefit from a bit of a tune, you know, supercharged one, and then it's awesome. You then do need to improve the tires though, because the low grip tires just can't cope with too much power. It is a super fun, involving car. In fact, there's not many cars these days that feel as good as this to drive. I love them. Okay then, you've now heard the case for each of the five best Toyota sports cars, but which do you think is the best overall? Now what I want you to do is just click up there on the pop-out banner to cast your vote. Do you think it is the 2000 GT, the AE86, the Celica GT4 Colos Science, the Mark IV Supra, or the GT86? Now while you're deciding, I will admit there's probably a couple of omissions, such as the Mark 1 MR2. Maybe there's some others as well. If you can think of them, let me know in the comments box below. Anyway, have you casted your vote? Good. I'm very excited to find out what won.